you could be sort of unrealistically positive or, or negative about the current situation. Obviously, I, I think, you know, that a good idea about the solution or about solutions or where we may come from here um, need to stem from a good analysis. So in that sense, I take my role as an academic quite seriously and really try to understand where are we at uh, and in that sense inspire people in a, in a certain way to look at these more broader issues and take them into account. You know, I'm a scientist after all, a social scientist. I just want to look at the situation as we have it now and depart from there. So we talk about transformative change. I feel it's very important to talk about you know, the kind of change situation that we have now. So what do we mean with change in the 21st century? And what, where do we go from there? To really understand you know, how is change changing and what kind of opportunities for transformative change does that entail? I think what is, what is important to realize is that the material sort of side of power still very much uh, is on the side of the processes focusing on or at least geared towards increasing inequality and destroying nature. Uh, if you just look at the Fortune top 500 uh, companies, you know, all these companies, you know, at least from, from the environmental, but also I think from, from a social uh, equity point of view, you can see that they make their money mostly by things that are nece not necessarily uh, very good for life uh, in general. Um, so for me, the emphasis should always be on the politics of change. Yeah? Which change interests need to be promoted and which change interests need to be demoted? But this comes back to how historical change actually works, right? And I have, a, I think, maybe um, sort of surprising um, inspiration there. Actually, I got inspired by Milton Friedman. You may know him, the uh, big neoliberal Chicago boy, uh, you know, ideologist behind uh, the, whole, the whole neoliberal turn. But he saw this very clearly. He saw this very accurately, I think, the way historical change works, right? So under Keynesianism for 30 years, you know, he was, he and his, his team of people were actually quite marginalized compared to dominant Keynesian economics. And he kept on saying, you know, once the material circumstances change and our, you know, we have to repeat our message, people all of a sudden will start taking up this message and, and, and roll with it. And this happened exactly in, this, in the 70s, right? Where some major material dynamic change with the oil crisis and other things, and all of a sudden their message became much more popular and was taken up and, and you know, brought into effect and into practice in, in an incredible way. And into such a way, of course, that it's now completely dominant and we don't think we can think outside of it anymore. So almost we're in such a hegemonic situation that just to maintain this kind of thinking like Schumacher did and like others did is already in itself almost a political act, right? That you can think outside of contemporary capitalist structures. That already itself is almost very powerful. Um, but then, like, like Friedman did, you know, to keep on discussing this with, with networks, with other people who also believe that there's actually more to life than, you know, what we're being told uh, in the contemporary framework. I think it's, it's quite powerful and I think the historical or the sort of the material dynamics and we see them changing around us with with with, with climate change with with the whole terrorism threat and all of those kind of things where people you know increasingly see such a difference and such a contradiction between their daily lived lives and what's happening around them that they will start you know seeking for other other stories and other ways to explain this and, and they will come to these kind of ways of thinking again. One of the most inspiring things in that, that sense, I think, was, you know, in the UK, uh, economic students during the financial crisis, who just couldn't believe that, you know, what they were told actually, you know, you know didn't respond, uh, correspond at all to the reality of what they saw around, uh, around them. And they started, you know, a whole movement to try to change, uh, you know, the, the economics profession. And this has had effect in the Netherlands, this has had effect in South Africa where I do a lot of, lot of work. But people, you know, so these kind of change effects where people start thinking differently, taking things more politically, can be incredibly powerful. And I'm pretty sure, and I don't know when, I'm not a <laughs> magician or I can't look, look in, the, in, the, in the magic bowl, so... But I do think that the material circumstances that, that, that we see around us are more conducive to different types of thinking and that, that's where I get at least some positive idea about the future to hopefully um, you know inspire and, and talk with other people to to strengthen these kind of networks and you know uh, push these kind of ideas.
So a similar story goes for the environmental side. So when I talk about development, I always include both environment and, and the social side of things. For me, these are always inherently interconnected. Because in that sense, I also believe literally that sort of focusing on this idea of the quality of life comes back to me directly. So I think when you're dealing with practical on the ground issues that are always very nuanced, never black or white, uh, gray, etc. Um, you try to take decisions in the best way possible, but if you have a longer term vision about where you need to go to or what kind of change you want to pursue for the longer term. So in, in my case here, a much more qualitative type of life, a qualitative type of development away from... It, it makes you, I think, think differently about um, everyday practical realities and what you do with certain numbers or with certain research and, and, and how you take that up, what you want to do with the particular type of influence that you have and all those kind of things. So it, yeah, really a two-stage two -stage strategy. In the, in the mean, you know, in the sort of short term, try to do what you can under difficult circumstances, but keep that longer vision of a structurally different world in the back of your mind and make baby steps towards that. And that to me is the only sort of realistic way that actual historical change works over a longer period of time. And hopefully by providing that bit more of a broader vision and longer term, you can help set a longer term goal for people and they can help make the baby steps towards that. Processes, of course, if you focus on particular processes and, and, and inequality in that sense, you know, as a side effect of contemporary <laughs> capitalist development and simply how, how it works, um, you know, it has a certain perhaps linearity to it, but it doesn't necessarily have to, right? Under capitalism, there are ways in which, and this has happened in the past, in which you can rein in inequality and still live under a capitalist system. Everybody can look at themselves first. How do I make you know, qualitative shifts in my own life, in my own being, in the way that I look at my job and deal with my colleagues in order to make you know, the, the, the smaller kind of steps that I think are necessary in order to see life not as atomized individual beings that you know, have to be resilient, as I, as I mentioned before, and that have to face up to you know, this disastrous world with all these threats and all of that, but actually see themselves as political agents that can, in any situation, you know, make choices, that have choices, you know, political choices about where to go from here. And to me, one of the things that I, I, I generally or normally tend to focus on is, is the kind of logics with which you make choices. If it's a more qualitative logic or a more quantitative logic, a logic more towards right, a sort of capitalist type of logics that lead to more competition or other types of logics that, that diffuse competition, whereby you're actually, actually interested in another human being, where you're actually interested in what's happening with others instead of focusing on your own immediate gain, you know, we're increasingly focused to do that and see ourselves as commodities. No, I, I, want to, I want people to see themselves first and foremost as political actors. And I think that is very powerful in and of itself. So I hope if people take something from this, that they you know, further sharpen their own profile as political actors and, 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 and not afraid to be political in the situations that they find themselves in, even if some of the messages that they might then subsequently say go against the grain or are uncomfortable for other people. That I think is a very powerful way of, of you know, affecting change. And the small little moments where we feel that we're connected with others. And uh, you know, Hard and Negri call this the common, right? The stuff that we all have in common. And I think that that's a very powerful, powerful concept. But if you take that one step further and make it more political, again, immediately you see the choices you can make in practice. You know, are you, you know if you work on vegetables, are you going to privatize your, or are you going to share it, right? Are you going to make it into a common? And in that sense also, you know, share the benefits that, that you derive from that. You may not be rich, you may not get all the attention, but at least, you know, I think you're working towards a different world.